Hi, I'm Sam and welcome to Yacht Wings, a channel where we discuss all things mystical and mythological. And today we're going to be discussing Harry Potter Kundalini. Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling is a master of archetypal storytelling. In fact, she's one of the greatest of all time, right up there with Lewis and Tolkien. But what does it mean to tap into these archetypes? Well, Rowling didn't invent the hippogriff or the basilisk. Instead, she samples certain creatures and themes throughout mythology and uses them for what they represent. And it's kind of like making a quilt. In a sense, J.K. Rowling does with myth what a quilt maker does with fabric, looking through all of it and picking certain tones and patterns and weaving them together to create something magnificent. And you could argue that with the Harry Potter series, Rowling has created a world more rich and complex than many of the worlds where these creatures and characters were pulled from in the first place. Now, many of these things we just connect with subconsciously and we enjoy the book or the movie, but some of them we notice. One I noticed was this character Fluffy. Now, it may seem totally random that a three-headed dog would guard the passageway to the area underneath Hogwarts, but somehow it works. And that's because Rowling is connecting with ancient mythology. The three-headed dog Cerberus guards the passage to the underworld. You may not know that, but somehow you connected with it on a subconscious level, and Carl Jung would say that's because that's where that theme came from. It bubbled up from our collective subconscious. An example of a myth that I didn't notice, that is to say I connected with it on a heart level, but just not intellectually, is this idea of a kundalini awakening. Now this comes from Hindu mythology, and it's the idea that your spiritual power is trapped in you like a trapped serpent and it needs to be released. And once you do so, you enter this new spiritual dimension and learn how to use your spiritual powers. Now, if this sounds familiar, it's because this is the first magic we see Harry Potter do. He releases a serpent and immediately following that, he's told that he is now of age to enter this new magical world and learn how to use his powers. Now, as for me personally, I wouldn't make these connections until years later when I took up the practice of centering prayer and started studying the teachings of Father Thomas Keating. Now, if you don't know who Keating is, he's a Trappist monk and just a beacon of light. Years ago, when Father Keating was still alive, he was living at St. Benedict's Monastery, located in this gorgeous valley in beautiful Snowmass, Colorado. And I was in a centering prayer group at that time, and we had arranged a retreat where we would go to the monastery and stay in hermitages there. And at that time, someone had accused me of having a kundalini awakening. I'd never heard the word kundalini, so I grabbed this book by Carl Jung, and I read it. Red is a strong term, I skimmed it. And then my spiritual mentor at that time who was arranging this retreat said, hey, how about you present on the topic of Kundalini maybe a couple nights on this retreat? Now I thought, perfect. I mean, I did skim the book. This is a great idea. Then a Kundalini yogi friend of his caught wind of what we were doing and said, this is actually a horrible idea and it could be potentially dangerous. My initial reaction was, this is a joke, right? He's telling us we're meddling with powers beyond our understanding. But then he said he was going to fly out to Colorado and oversee things to make sure we were safe. And I thought, you know, he is taking this very seriously. Kundalini yoga in its essence is the most dangerous form of yoga. I'm saying dangerous because it's the most potent also. What is most potent is always the most dangerous, if improperly handled. Now the key words there are if improperly handled. Would I have handled things improperly? Absolutely. So what a gift to have this yogi come out and join us. He and I stayed in a two-person hermitage for the duration of that stay, and he taught me about kundalini energy. Now bear in mind, I'm still not qualified to present on this subject, but in my limited understanding, this energy is like a serpent that travels up the spine. In your youth, it becomes locked at the base of your spine, beneath your root chakra, like a coiled serpent. In fact, the word kundalini translates into coiled, but you can raise the kundalini and cause it to travel up the spine, going up like a thermometer to the crown chakra. Now once it reaches the crown chakra, it causes this chakra to blossom like a flower. In Hinduism and Buddhism, they call this the thousand-petaled lotus. 
and this is what we refer to as a kundalini awakening. Now another example of sacred serpent symbolism to come out of the mythology of Hinduism and Buddhism is the Naga. The Nagas are mythological creatures that are half human, half serpent, but have the power to be fully either. And the males are called a Naga, but the female is called a Nagini. And at no point is the male serpent that Potter liberates when he discovers his power referred to as Naga, but the female serpent that keeps Potter imprisoned in his curse is referred to as Nagini. So can we raise the Kundalini? Yes, we can. One way is to create a conducive atmosphere so that slowly it rises. The other way is to provoke it. Move! Move! He's asleep! Provoke it in such a way that it raises quickly. <laughs> if it raises quickly, then everything changes dramatically. <laughs> so when I was on that spiritual retreat, every morning at 4.30 a.m. we would go down the valley to the monastery and join the monks for vigils. But I could never get this yogi to come with me. He was very apprehensive and he said, you know, I don't really need to go down there. Most Christians don't understand this sort of thing. They don't tolerate this sort of thing. And I said, no way, these guys would love it. They're very open-minded, and I can see comparisons between Christianity and Kundalini energy, but he wouldn't go down. So when I got home, I decided I'd Google this and say, has anyone else seen these comparisons? And what do you know? I found a book on the subject. And then, to my astonishment, I noticed that the foreword to the book was written by none other than Thomas Keating himself. And I don't share this story about him missing out on that opportunity as a big I told you so, but rather I want to point out how important it is that people can engage in an interfaith dialogue. And I think Jews and Christians could learn from these themes. Think about when Moses raises up the bronze serpent on a staff in the desert, or when he wants to demonstrate to Pharaoh the power of God. Behold, the power of God. So he turns his staff into a serpent. So if these are complex spiritual concepts being taught through archetypal storytelling, you can't help but notice some similarities. And then there's the rod of Moses' brother Aaron, which blossoms at the end. And what is an archetypal story versus a story? Well, Carl Jung would tell you that on an archetypal level, people don't have ideas, ideas have people. So I'll leave you with this example that Jung gives about this archetype. Yeah. But the introvert is, is uh, the introvert uh, variety is, is more difficult because he has intuitions as to the subjective factor, namely the inner world. Yeah. And of course that is now very difficult to understand uh, because what he sees uh, are most uncommon things and uh, he doesn't like to talk of them because people won't understand it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for instance, once I, I had a patient, a young woman, about 20, 27 or 8, and her first words were, when I had seated her, she said, you know, doctor, I come to you because I have a, a, a snake in my abdomen. Hmm. I said, what? <laughs> she said, uh, yes, a snake. Uh, a black snake coiled up right in the in in in, in, in the bottom of my abdomen. You know, uh, I I I don't mean it literally, uh, <laughs> but uh, I should say it was a snake. It was a snake. <laughs> see? Uh, about the fifth or sixth hour, she said, "Doctor, I must tell you, uh, the, the snake has risen. It is now about here." <laughs> and then. In, in, uh, on the tenth day, I say, now, this is our last hour, and do you feel cured? And she said, beaming, she said, you know, this morning, it came up <laughs> and came out of my mouth and the head was golden. Mm. And that, those were her last words. Mm. A person cannot possibly speak of, uh, of her experiences. Yes. Because everybody would think she's absolutely crazy. Thanks. Any time.